Poštovane gledateljice i gledatelji, ja sam Zorana Kujundžić, a vi pratite vijesti emisije Cenzura. Za sve organizacije civilnog društva i jedinice lokalne i regionalne samouprave jedna obavijest. U sklopu programa Europa za građane objavljen je novi programski vodič za 2013. godinu. Programski vodič treba detaljno proučiti jer je došlo do nekih važnijih promjena vezanih za kriterije prihvatljivosti i prijave projekata. U okviru istog programa Ured za udruge organizira radionice za pripremu projektnih prijedloga kojima je ist cilj okupiti predstavnike organizacija civilnog društva i jedinica lokalne i područne samouprave te ih detaljno uputiti u mogućnosti ostvarivanja financijskih potpora u sklopu programa Europa za građane i ponuditi im pomoć u razradi konkretnih projektnih ideja. Radionica će se održati 16. sjećnja 2013. godine u informacijskom centru EU Trg maršala Tita 6 u Zagrebu s početkom u 9.30 minuta. Novi programski vodič za 2013. godinu možete preuzeti na stranicama Ureda za udruge www.uzuvrh.hr. Europska udruga gospodarskih komora objavila je rezultate analize o usklađenosti poslovanja malih i srednjih tvrtki na području Zapadnog Balkana s normama europske pravne stečevine koje je Republika Hrvatska usvojila putem nacionalnog zakonodavstva. Analiza je provedena u okviru Business Support programa Europske komisije. U projektu je sudjelovala i Hrvatska gospodarska komora te više od 500 kompanija s područja Zapadnog Balkana, a rezultati pokazuju da je više od 80% kompanija svoje poslove uskladilo s normama Europske pravne stečevine. Rezultati analize pokazuju da hrvatske male i srednje kompanije trebaju dodatne napore uložiti u povećanje energetske učinkovitosti, ljudske resurse te financijska ulaganja. Vijesti su pripremljene uz potporu Europske unije u sklopu projekta Informiraj se i odluči, financiranog kroz program IPA Info 2010. Sadržaj vijesti, odgovornost je udruge za promicanje ljudskih prava i medijskih sloboda Cenzura Plus, te ne odražava nužno gledišta Europske unije. Jednaki u različitosti, stop diskriminaciji. U Hrvatskoj je na snazi zakon o suzbijanju diskriminacije. Područje rada samo je jedno od područja u kojima je diskriminacija zabranjena. Potražite zaštitu, obratite se pučkom pravobranitelju. I'm Henk Fischer. I'm a program manager, a task manager in the European Commission in Brussels of the Directorate General Enlargement. We try to help the countries that want to join the EU, and in case of Croatia, but about to join the EU, to prepare themselves to be a member of our club. 
In the Directorate General, I particularly deal with relations with civil society organizations. We have one of the things called the Civil Society Facility, by which we aim to create a sort of civil society friendly society within the Western Balkan and Turkey. In this context, we had this a final conference of the projects who received money from us on the several calls for proposals. As you know, we are not in a position to give money like that to initiatives we think are good. We have them evaluated by experts in the field who say what is a good proposal and what not within the frame we set forward in our so-called guidelines. Well, these projects all have been successful uh, in winning the grant and implementing their projects. Please to, uh, to tell us to, to, to about this uh, grant scheme that all these projects are uh, funded from yeah. just well, to, to we have a unique occasion that we now have two grant schemes who come at a close at more or less the same time we had just before our event a meeting of the european economic and social committee in the western balkan forum and we had a final conference of Zdravigrad in their project, one of the projects of, uh, who will end by the end of this month. So I said, why don't we combine all our efforts to get a wider audience for all the events by doing it together. So we have now back to back the different events. One calls for proposal dealt with minorities and vulnerable groups. Very important because these are all we left out, the last people think about. If you're small and a minority, it's easily for politicians to neglect you. So we have to promote that. The other one dealt with social economic partnerships. In particular, we believe that if social economic partners can do things together, it saves government time and money, so they don't need to do it themselves. If the social economic partners can regulate how they do it to deal with their workers, guarantee safety and health of the work, it will take a lot of work out of the hands of the governments. And they can then steer that process. So we want to develop that. And there we use several teams, the social economic occupation, safety and health, the work on environment and energy efficiency. Because we saw these are elements where the business community, the economic partners, can work with civil society, the more social partners. If you talk about energy efficiency, there is a business opportunity there for insulation, for new materials, for doing the works, putting solar panels and so forth. But there's also a green objective, save the earth, avoid waste of resources. So these two are then partners in crime, if you want. They are allies. Let them work together. And traditionally, they were opponents to each other. And I say, even if though you may not share everything the same thing, on certain fronts, you may find that you are, have a common objective. Work on what unites, not on what divides. And which is basically, for me, the motto of the European Union. Think about what unites, not what divides. And that's what these projects tend to do, and that's why we had this call, they applied, these were successful, implemented, and now we look at the end, what we have, and what can we do next. And what is next? Next is, for them, the continuation of their efforts, grouping up, and trying to reuse their material, guides, audit reports, and all that, to help businesses, for instance, to implement uh, energy efficiency in their industry, to help uh, schools to be more conscious about energy efficient, to do the works which will save later. We from our end will try to see how we can involve the banks in that by making sure that the projects are bankable. That the bank says, I can put the money here because I see a return coming. That's where we work together and there we are so happy to have experts from the EU, experts from the region who can help each other on that, making that happen. They say, okay, send it to us, we'll have a check and then that will generate income for these organizations for the business representative organizations but also for the environmental associations. It's always very nice to see that they've been able to do something interesting with the money we've, we gave them and which they self also contribute to with 20 percent. But we would like that these things live on beyond our funding and normally a project will take two years and it's very difficult to have something sustainable just in two years. So we say perhaps your colleagues who did also a project can help you further to advance your own products, your results, your initiatives. So therefore these final conferences are very important to link them up again. To make sure that they can see what someone else has done and perhaps get inspired and reuse that in their own activities. And I've seen already uh, some interesting initiatives coming forward, like in the field of energy efficiency, 
or occupation and safety and health at work to make sure workers uh, work in appropriate uh, conditions. I've seen uh, joint coalitions coming forward and to speak out for the rights of vulnerable groups, minorities, to make sure that uh, the voice of the blind people are also learned, that they also find a place in society. And these events always remind me that what we're trying to do is worthwhile, what we're trying to do actually can make a difference, and it encourages me to go further, to, to advance on this, and to and that way sometimes accept the bureaucracy which is around my work to swallow that because in the end it is worth it. I hope that what the projects have achieved now, that they can continue to strengthen that and that they can convince the citizens that what they do is actually in the interest of the whole of their society, is in the interest of their citizens. That is what we want to hope for. Mm -hmm. And after these experiences, in which way are you going to improve your role in it? I think we have to work even more on getting in dialogue with civil society. There's such amount of things they know, but they sometimes have difficulties in telling us what is really known. So we need to seek more actively their input. And in that context, we try to do all kinds of methods. I myself, I'm very active on, on Facebook, and I want to, to give me information, to, to confront me with things, to inform me about things that go wrong, so that you can see how we together can make it better. That type of communication, not only towards the citizens, but also among them themselves and with us, is essential. There we still have to work much harder. And what about financing and crediting? Because lots of uh, organizations have uh, these kind of problems because they, don't, uh, they have uh, difficulties to, to find some matching funds and stuff like that. Indeed. The, as always, money is always a problem. I also have, would like to do more that I can in order to save the environment by isolating better my house, but in the end it's more expensive well, to put solar panels. So everybody has that problem. In this current situation of crisis, it's very difficult for uh, the EU to explain to its citizens that more money will be spent on outside. In, in my country, I come from the Netherlands, the government is cutting on development aid. So it will not be rosier, it will not be easier. So all the more we need to build upon what was already there instead of redoing it all over again. All on that we need to help each other, to accept a little bit less, but to really make something worthwhile we can have a spin-off. Therefore, in our funding, we need to really make sure that if we support projects, that these projects can actually continue after us when we don't have more funding left. We need to be a, some sort of generator of a spin-off, of a snowball effect. That if people know, okay, if you're that good and the EU is willing to give money for your project, then we as other donors should perhaps also assist certain things, certain elements. Uh, one of the projects we have here has got also co-financing from the UNDP. We need to strengthen the brands, the quality label of civil society organizations by stating those who get money from us know how to handle money and there every euro you give to them is a euro well spent. And I'm quite sure that seeing the initiatives here that when you start small you actually can make a difference and generate additional income. But it will not be done by each and every one who starts it. I think that overall we should be happy if 10% can continue. But that 10% will make all the other 90% worthwhile because they will continue for the rest of their existence. And in your, in your opinion, uh, what kind of topics are important to empower here in Croatia? To all the whole the rest of the thing which remains a top priority is the fight against corruption. <laughs> when I dealt with organizations fighting corruption, they said the Commission should be attacking our government. Well, it's a bit difficult. We in the Commission are to implement legislation, to propose legislation. We cannot say to democratically elected governments that they're doing something wrong. That's not our task. Also, it has to do, in my view, with culture. What I, a Swedish person, may think is corruption. Someone in Croatia may say, well, yeah, they're just doing a friend a favor. So it has to come again from the citizens. Essential in these things is 
openness, transparency. Everybody should be able to know what happens with its taxpayers' money. And then putting things out in the open become a more of a culture. People say, indeed, that is acceptable behavior and that is not acceptable behavior. Um, and of course, people who do something against the law need to be punished for it. But it's even bad if people who do something against the law themselves are not aware of it, that they're doing something against the law. Then it's getting very dangerous. Uh, let's go back to these projects here. Uh, what are their major problems? Ah, well, the first biggest problem they always encounter is how to get the money. In particular, if we talk about funding from the European Union, it is very competitive, it's very difficult. Uh, the average success rate of our calls for proposals is 10%, which means that 90% of these people have put in all their efforts for nothing, which is very disappointing for them. Um, next to that, they need to make sure the life after the project, so how to continue what they do. They, they set up a system, they perhaps recruit some people, and then when the funding is finished, what do they do? Need to fire these people? That's not nice. What should we do? Hunt for other fundings. What do we do when there is a gap? So they often look to us and say, can't you continue financing? I said, no, there is an end to finance. So for them the challenge is the moment they start, they should already prepare the end. And they should think about, we have to do something which we can sustain afterwards, otherwise we should not apply. To give an example, I saw projects where they train people. And it sounds very nice and interesting, but I said, if we train people to become unemployed or to remain unemployed, we take them off the streets for two years and we give them false hope. That is not in our interest. We really need to do that what is essential can have this spin of effect and can advance the, the society. And in that context, going back to the top priority, fight against corruption, every money which you can save by not having corruption in procurement can be spent on better things. So, my, if I would be a citizen in these countries, my top priority would be to make sure I have an open, transparent and clear government which will not allow for any possible corruption because in the end it's the EU taxpayer, it's the taxpayer who pays for the corruption. Do you have some ideas how to help uh, these organizations to, uh, to maintain sustainability? Well, we have to basically tell them from the beginning what to do. So our guidelines are quite competitive, that's already limiting it away. Secondly, we have to accompany them, perhaps a bit more actively. We put in a system in place, technical assistance to civil society organizations, TAXO, with advisors in every country in the Western Balkans. And one of the tasks is to be to help these projects. They may have day-to-day -day problems in managing the funds and dealing with me or with my colleagues, but they also may say, well, we, we would like to do something more, but we can't get to others who could perhaps use it or who could work with us. So to see that you can have some residential support of the resident advisor who could say, okay, let's work now with some other projects to do something similar, like we do here, and do that more regular. So not just at the end, but also during the implementation. We need to promote all the good work. We need to tell everybody, as well in the EU, what has been done and what has been a result of it. Again, using example, if we support startups in the social economic field, and 10% makes it, that 10% needs to make sure that all the other 90% was worth the investment. So we need to promote that. We need to promote also when things go wrong and say, this you can learn from. So we need to share best practices, but also bad practices. And there we as EU, I think, could make the difference with our technical assistance. But it requires them to tell us, to share us, to communicate with us. Coming back to another priority, communication transparency. Our project name is EU Built Energy Efficiency and it is a European Union funded project uh, under the socio-economic partnership program. Uh, we have been working on this project in the last, uh, for the last two years. It started at the end of 2010 and uh, this is the closing conference of this uh, whole program. Uh, I am representing, I'm the pro leader project coordinator in this project. 
Uh, I have partners from Albania, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, and Belgium. Uh, we, the, 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 the main uh, the, the name of the project is financing energy efficiency in buildings. We are trying to improve the uh, financing methods and financing instruments for energy efficiency in buildings. When we say buildings, it includes the residential buildings and uh, commercial buildings, which is like uh, shopping malls uh, or, or hospitals or schools. Uh, so we are not uh, related to industrial energy efficiency, which is which is inclu which includes uh, the factory factory buildings, you know, uh, because uh, in all of our countries, uh, industry has more incentives or has more uh, financial uh, instruments for energy efficiency. But unfortunately, the end users uh, who are living in you know houses or flats or uh, group of buildings. Uh, we don't have enough information, we don't have enough uh, finances and we don't have enough uh, incentives for uh, improving our homes uh, about energy efficiency. You define maybe that term? It is about paying less bills at the end of the month and uh, leaving a better future for our children because everybody knows about climate change. Everybody knows we are nearly going to be finished with the natural resources. So uh, every country is trying to find a different way to, to uh, get more energy. They are either uh, building some new nuclear plants, they are uh, trying to build new dams, they are trying to build something new, but we say, uh, of course, we should try to do something new. But on the other hand, we are wasting so much energy in our houses, in our schools, in our hospitals, in the hotels. Uh, we should start doing something to save that energy, which we are paying a lot of money. All of these partner countries and uh, we as a uh, leading partner as Turkey, we are dependent on other countries for our energy. So this is really very uh, crucial for a country to be dependent on other countries for electricity, for natural gas, for any type of energy you need. Uh, so uh, it is very important to uh, raise the awareness of the end users because you know we are from media, I am from business sector, I have partners from energy agencies, from banks, uh, from government. We are always complaining that governments are not uh, preparing new incentives for a flat owner to change their windows, uh, change their roofs or change their uh, heating systems. We are always complaining that banks are not uh, introducing new credit lines. They are after their profit and they are not giving us uh, low uh, interest rates. But we are always uh, forgetting that we are end users. The, everybody is the end user here. So we should start from our houses. Uh, we should start saving. We should teach our children uh, that they should... This, these are so simple things, you know. We should teach our children to turn off a light or to turn the tap off. You know, uh, the, the very simple things, but uh, basically this is affecting how you are living and how you should act in the future. Uh, what we did in our project is, uh, first uh, we decided to uh, know about the country's present situation about energy efficiency in buildings. So uh, we started to prepare the country reports uh, where uh, you can find on our website uh, where we try to state the uh, present situation uh, about energy efficiency from different uh, sectors because this subject is uh, related to everyone. I mean, it is related to finance sector, it is related to industry, governments, municipalities, uh, NGOs, uh, universities, academicians. So uh, it is a very uh, large issue. We needed to get the views of all the interested parties. So we make uh, round, we made roundtable meetings. We are six partners. We have uh, five to six roundtable meetings with the related sectors. 
and uh, at the end of the second year uh, we have made around 35 roundtable meetings, two international conferences, uh, two study visits, four workshops uh, for this project. We have reached to 2,400 uh, experts because these meetings weren't open to public. This was for the experts on this area. And uh, at the end of these roundtable meetings, we finished the country reports. Uh, we made some SWOT analysis for each country. We make a need assessment and we had uh, prepared some recommendations to each sector, to each government, to uh, everyone who is related to energy efficiency issue. And uh, we have shared our experiences, we have shared that uh, data, that knowledge in the workshops, in the, in the conferences. And we prepared a guidebook. Uh, this guidebook is uh, a two years work result and uh, you can find the present situation and the SWOT analysis of all the partner countries and some recommendations for both our countries and European Union because basically they are the ones who is funding this project and uh, there are a lot of things going on about energy efficiency in European Union which we should be you know uh, sharing this information with them as well uh, because uh, since we are uh, going to be a member in the future we need to be ready uh, for what is waiting for us uh, it is important to be to, to uh, get ready as, a, as our industries, as our governments, as our NGOs even uh, and we should be expecting uh, some, I don't know, more, more uh, support from the European Union on this subject. How was it that process uh, because of um, admi administration and uh, partners that are living in some other countries uh, speaking some other well, let, let me say it this way, I had uh, dark black hair before the project started. Now I have so much white hair, <laughs> I started uh, uh, dyeing my hair to brown. But uh, okay, of course this is a joke. My partners, uh, especially because this is a very common and very important issue, this is not something very technical, everybody knows the things that should be done, but uh, we are a little bit uh, lazy probably about this. Uh, we found out that uh, the situation in the partner countries are so similar to each other. Of course there were some changes. For example, in Turkey we don't have an energy agency, but, but in Albania, Serbia and Macedonia they have energy agencies. This is very important because uh, uh, this issue should be uh, governed from a uh, one from one point. A lot of ministries, a lot of NGOs, a lot of uh, universities are uh, included in this. So everybody is doing something, but no one is coordinating this. So energy agency is important. Uh, uh, plus, uh, data collection is very important. None of these countries know how many buildings they have in their countries. If you don't have data, you won't have finances. No one is going to finance your projects or finance your uh, buildings, new buildings, etc. So uh, we are. This is why we are. We have these recommendations for each related sector here. If you don't know how many buildings you have, if you don't know how much you can save in those buildings. If you don't know what should be done in those buildings, then you don't know anything. You, you just, you know, you can make thousands of meetings, you can make thousands of study visits, but you are still in the same point. So, uh, we are starting to take the initiative in this. We are going to start some new projects, some uh, regional ones maybe, some regional ones in our countries. Because if you start from some point, it is going to come uh, afterwards uh, more large-scale projects. For example, if you can count the buildings in a municipality region, of a big city or you can count the buildings and make the assessments about energy efficiency, some energy audits in a just small part of a city, then it can be a model for others. 
you can learn from your experience and you can make it in a uh, more quicker way and then it won't be a big problem afterwards you know what about coordination of, uh, of this kind of projects what would you change after this experience uh, well actually we have a uh, we have guidelines uh, when you are uh, granted by European Union uh, with the money they give you the guidelines how to coordinate this project there are a lot of rules about financing it, about uh, the partners, documentation, and uh, we, we just, all of us uh, has been working on other projects beforehand, so we are experienced. We know that if at the beginning you just uh, detail the rules, then everybody is going to know what they, and they can or can't do in this project because uh, we have been monitoring uh, and uh, auditing uh, by some external auditors, by the European Union, European Commission, so as long as you keep with the rules, uh, it's not very difficult, but of course, I mean, it is always difficult to work with different people from different countries, but still, uh, since Balkans, you know, they know each other, uh, we know each other, so uh, we didn't have a lot of problems actually, it was pretty good. <laughs> what, what are new ideas, what about um, new ways of, uh, of uh, thinking about this subject and also uh, after this experience? Mm -hmm. Do you have some new ideas how to, to do similar projects? Actually, we have been discussing this for the last six months nearly. Uh, while working on this project, we find out many uh, missing things, many, many things. We, there are a lot of new project subjects. It's just uh, choosing the right subject and finding the fund. Because, uh, for example, we can work on awareness rising. Awareness rising is uh, a project which needs a huge budget because if you want to get media interested in this type of thing, if you are going to give advertisements on television, on radio, this is not something cheap. So uh, an EU grant maybe is not enough uh, even for a project like this because uh, if you think about the Balkan countries plus Turkey, we are talking about nearly 90 million people here. So uh, this is a huge project. So we said, okay, this is something we can think about later and put it <laughs> aside. Uh, but still, uh, because we are uh, already interested in subject, this is not because the EU is giving this fund, so we should find something to do. Energy efficiency is our, one of our main objectives as institutions anyway. So we are going to keep on working on the topic. We have a web page for the project, we have a Facebook page of the project, and uh, we are going to keep on sharing the information, the, the detailed information like legislation, laws, uh, action plans, plus uh, activities we are doing, uh, plus some uh, new news or uh, some details new uh, project subjects, I don't know. So we are going to keep on uh, networking and in to improve networking and to, to share our experiences by internet or uh, by just uh, attending to our activities uh, uh, from different countries. And we are going to promote these results because this was the first time that a country report, a SWOT analysis or a guidebook was prepared on this subject. So it is going to be promoted in all of the other activities we are already doing. And what about this grant scheme, mm -hmm. the CU grant scheme? Uh, what do you think about it? Good. <laughs> well, it is, it is necessary. Uh, it is not only EU that who is giving grants. Uh, UN, UN is giving grants, some uh, banks, EBRD, KFW, especially about energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. There are some other banks, some other institutions. Uh, it depends on your subject. If, if you are uh, working on a subject which is sustainable, you will one way or other find some finances for it. But if, you, if your subject is something, you know, 
like tangible or or uh, you cannot go on working on it after the fund finishes then you are in big trouble uh, i know some projects which are very useful but still because of uh, not finding the right funds uh, they need to stop uh, the project at a very crucial point uh, so here i think coordination is very important you should be always thinking like two years later, a year later, six months later, what is going to go on. And it's not something very uh, easy in our countries especially. You never know what will happen in the even very near future. Uh, so you are on your own. So my name is uh, Lutz Walter. I'm uh, working for Euratex, which is the European textile and apparel, so clothing industry confederation based in Brussels, in Belgium. And uh, we represent as an umbrella organization all the industry uh, employers uh, federation in the textile and clothing sector in, in Europe. So all the national uh, federations are members of the European branch federation. Uh, and that also includes a number of, of countries in the Western Balkan uh, area, like Croatia, like Serbia, uh, like uh, Bulgaria also, uh, which are already integrated in this European network. Uh, we have another, uh, a number of other countries that uh, we started to work with, like uh, Macedonia, like Albania, like Bosnia, which are not yet integrated in this network, but which we have started to work with in view of uh, uh, connecting them also to us. And in this process, the Tex Web project, uh, which was funded under this uh, uh, pre-accession uh, assistance program by the European Commission over the last two years, uh, was very helpful because we have established all the, uh, all the connections with these organizations. Uh, we have also brought them together. So. Uh, all the organizations got to know each other here in the, in, the, in the Western Balkan regions and they got to know all their counterparts in, across Europe. Um, what we also uh, try to do is to strengthen those organizations in their national uh, situations. Some of these organizations are very small organizations, one or two people only. Some of them have been created only very recently, um, so they lack uh, of course capacities, they lack uh, expertise and what they often also lack is a visibility and a recognition by essentially governments, the national or regional governments, uh, which should see those organizations as very important counterparts for economic development, for social issues, for regional development issues and so on and so forth, where these associations can channel, diffuse the problems, the needs of their industry members in, in the country and in the region. Uh, what were the biggest problems in um, communication or in this work process? Uh, well, the important point, what I said before, is that uh, these organizations, they, uh, so the National uh, Industry Employers Federations, they have to develop capacities on the one side from a very small, often very small base. Uh, they have to be uh, recognized in, if I can say, in both directions, of course in direction of the government and of other um, important uh, stakeholder organizations like the trade unions and so on. But they also have to still uh, obtain full recognition of their own industry um, because these organizations, they live generally from the contributions of their industry members. So, and industry members would only pay their contributions if they see a value in having such an organization. So this is something that also they are still trying to build. So what kind of service, what kind of expertise, what kind of support they can give on a daily basis to their companies. And, uh, and this is something which, uh, which still is in, is in development in there are some areas or some, some activities which work very well, uh, some other activities which they still need to develop. And one of the areas that we specifically focused on, because it was a European funded project, is to prepare the industry for uh, um, the accession towards the EU and uh, the um, adoption of the EU legal framework. So there's a lot of uh, legislation, EU legislation, that 
of course, countries like Croatia that are acceding to the EU need to adopt quite naturally. But even uh, for countries who are not acceding to the EU, a lot of their industry, they sell their products on the EU market. So their products and their production processes also have to correspond to the rules in the markets where they sell. So if there is uh, legislation on environment, on social issues like health and safety and all these kinds of things, these, these, these things have to be respected by the companies and the companies have to know them. And this is a lot of what we, what we try to do in the project. So we organize seminars, bringing experts from uh, the uh, from European countries, from the European uh, uh, European or national uh, uh, federations in uh, in the in the EU countries, to um, uh, to the Western Balkan countries here to organize training seminars to say, well, how do we do in our country? How did we prepare our industry? Well, how do we support our industry on a daily basis with uh, with these kind of things? So that is uh, uh, that was um, uh, a lot of what we do. We're now looking at the at the at the results of it, or let's say the the the, the, the major needs going forward. Uh, what we have identified is two major issues. The first one, which is a really probably the biggest issue of all, is the issue of qualification and skills and education. So we we see that these sectors are in these these companies are in a process of modernizing. So they adopt newer production technologies. They adopt, uh, they have to provide new services, different services, better services to their customers. So they need more skills, they will need new skills of their employees. And uh, this is something which, um, which is especially difficult because uh, since the industry is not seen as a very uh, attractive industry, as a very uh, future oriented industry, um, there are not a lot of young people uh, that are very interested in entering into this industry. So we, the industry loses quite naturally people that retire and that have knowledge and have skills and so on, but there are not enough young people coming into the sector. Uh, then there is the problem that uh, new skills are needed. So the, the, the training systems, the education systems that are existing, they are not always adapted to the new skills, but they are teaching programs that are sometimes 20 years old, and a lot of that is obsolete. So also changing the training system, the education system is something that is, that is very important. And um, getting the, um, uh, the, the governments to understand that this is important and that they should invest in this. And they should invest in this because it is an important factor for the future. And that's something that we see very much in, uh, in many countries, not only in the Western Balkan area, but also in many countries that joined the European Union in the last uh, five to ten years, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltic states, which all have a similar structure, that they have still a lot of employment, a lot of jobs, a lot of uh, industry uh, in this sector, but the government is not interested in it. They see it as something of the past, something that is dying, that is disappearing, that is not of the future. So. They are not interested in doing policy support programs and so on. They want to support things that uh, that sound more sexy, biotechnology, IT, health, and, and so on and so forth, without a, a clear uh, understanding of what are the, the economic realities in their own countries or in their own regions. So if I'm in Denmark or in Sweden, where I hardly have textile industry operations left, well, but I have already a big uh, biotechnology or IT sector, it makes a lot of sense. But if I'm in a country where 20% of my industrial employment or 25% depends on the textile sector, I better do something there because it's much easier, much cheaper to retain 10 jobs there than to create one new job in another sector that I don't have. So there is a lot of a uh, lot of this uh, uh, convincing that we also try to do uh, on that side. And also, what we see very important uh, is regional um, clustering. So trying to bring all on a regional level because the industry is very much regional clustered traditionally so you have areas where the industry has traditionally been very strong and where they still are and really in this re in these regions where sometimes also the um, the recognition from the political side is stronger because they, they see it daily that well when they go to their uh, offices and whatever they passing by a textile factory and so so they see it more as a reality uh, to, to say, well, let's strengthen these, these regional structures. So make sure that 
there are services for the regional industry related to education, to technology, to uh, consulting and training, um, sometimes also questions of logistics and, 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 and these kind of things. Um, so bring these, 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 these regional players together, make them work together. Uh, that is something that we see happen a lot in, uh, in, in Western Europe and it's something which uh, also I think we should focus on in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, in the Western Balkan countries. It's something that the European Commission also has recognized uh, under the term smart specialization. So they want um, the member states and the regions to specialize, but in a smart way. And it's actually not to say we look at another country uh, which may have a completely different economic reality and we copy what they have done because it sounds sexy. No, we look at our own uh, special situation and we try to come up with something that helps our own situation. And what and is special here? And, and, and I, I would say uh, they are, every, in, in every, every country has and every region should really make this a, a very good analysis of saying what are our strengths in terms of industrial activities, in terms of uh, also of education systems and, and, and so on and so forth. To say, well, if I have identified my strengths and I also make a bit of an, 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 um, an, an a kind of a forecasting to see what are the trends, what are the needs in the market and so on, then I can see um, really what I should support. So if I have a strength but there is really no market in the future anymore, okay, probably then you have to find ways of converting. But if you have identified a strong situation where there are opportunities, well, you better do that than trying to chase opportunities that exist in the market but that they don't have any, any basis. So creating things just on from uh, bottom up is not something that usually works. It's, a, it's really a recipe to waste a lot of taxpayers' money. We've seen it in many, many areas in Europe, especially sort of in more, in more rural areas and so on, where they try to, to all of a sudden develop a, a new factory for, for something which sounded very innovative, renewable energy or uh, semiconductors and so on. And in the end, it all it was a big investment and all faltered because there was no structure there, there were no competence, the companies could not employ people because there were no people in the area that had any background in these industries, there were no education systems that, uh, that trained young people in these sectors and it was impossible to attract people from far away because they didn't want to come to these regions. So, so therefore I, I, I think this, this smart specialization makes a lot of sense but it's also it's, it's not easy to do because you also have to go against conventional wisdom. If everybody says that our future is in renewable energy or, or uh, bio-based economy, to say we support something different is not easy politically to do. Uh, and so um, it, it is something which, uh, yeah, it, it requires courage, but it also requires a question of, of, of those who are supposed to benefit from this policy, they have to bring the right inputs to the policy makers. They cannot assume that the policy makers find out themselves, so they have to also be smart in bringing those inputs and telling them, well this is our situation and if you do this and this and that, our situation will improve or at least ma be maintained. And that's a, a big job that I think industry federations, uh, civil society organizations in general, trade unions and so on have to play. Uh, in order to give the governments the knowledge to do the right thing. Is it difficult to find the grants and uh, matching funds for those, for those kinds of uh, projects? Um, it's probably, uh, yes, in, it, it is probably more difficult to do it uh, than for sectors which have, for various reasons, a somewhat better image. Um, but it's often, in my opinion, a question of, of uh, the people being concerned, as I say, the industry itself, to organize themselves and to come with the ideas that the public, uh, that the, the governments can support. So it's, and that's a lot of what we see in, for instance, European uh, funding, structural funds and so on. The funds are there, the rules are there. The rules obviously are strict and the rules doesn't say, well, if somebody says, well, I need some money, here it is. It's more difficult than that and it should be more difficult than that. And many people are not 
uh, not prepared to take that challenge. But if you're prepared to take that challenge, usually it works. So I wouldn't say it's, it's per se a problem of no funds being available. It's a problem of the actors who are supposed to benefit from the funds really to organize themselves and to, to come up with the right projects. That I think is the big issue. And did you have uh, those kind of problems in this project? Well, uh, we have uh, in in general, when we uh, uh, we had, of course, our our partners from the Western Balkan countries to come to us and say, well, this is what we need. How can Europe help? And what we often had to say to them is not Europe that will help you in a direct sense. So it's not that you go to Brussels and somebody will help you. It is usually that. European support works through national and regional systems. So what you need to do is you know, have to know, of course, the rules of how it works, but then you have to bring this to those national or regional structures that are in charge of doing the uh, evaluating those projects and providing the funds according to the European rules, of course. And this is, uh, this is, I think, uh, and there we had some some very interesting uh, successes where we we, we gave to our partners to say, well, okay, this is what we know in those different programs they can fund, and this is what we have to do, this is where you have to go. And when they did it, it worked sometimes, not always, obviously there's competition, but, uh, but that's, that's the key to it. So was it difficult to work with the organization in, in this Western Balkan area? I wouldn't say not necessarily more difficult than in, in any other country. So uh, yes, there is a, there is a, a, a bit of a of a of a learning curve, I would say, ahead because um, um, the industry is perhaps not as uh, naturally um, uh, disposed to um, uh, to see the value of these organisations uh, like industry federations because there is not such a tradition from the past um, and there's also it's a bit of a, a chicken and egg problem if you have a small organization with limited funds it cannot do very much and the more you can do the more your potential members benefit from it so it's 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 a process of building capacities and that's that that's to us the importance is really that the process is is continued so that we don't, you don't have a situation where sometimes it all starts with one person with energy and vision and so on. And, but the risk always if, if, if you have one person with vision and energy is what if that person for whatever reason is not there anymore. And then systems can completely collapse. So what is important for us is that it becomes a process that is, goes on that is not dependent on one single individual but really something that is carried by a system a system from industry, a system uh, of government saying we want these organizations to be there. We don't see them as organizations that are constantly lobbying us to get something done, but more an organization that we need as a government to tell us what we should do to have a positive impact. And also, and that relates also, I think, in the, in the relationship to um, organizations like the trade unions, where, of course, yes, there is a conflict between employers and employee representative organizations, but that often comes down to the questions of, of collective bargaining or so salaries. But when you talk about making sure that there is still employment tomorrow, the two organizations are in perfect uh, uh, synergy. The industry wants to continue and the trade unions want that the jobs are still there tomorrow. So on a lot of things, they can work very constructively together and if they bring ideas together to the government that's also usually very very positively seen and, and very convincing so that's also something which it needs a uh, it needs cultural changes because there were there is more of this traditional view of there's the employers there's the employees or the trade unions and they're all constant constantly fighting against each other but the reality is is is, is not is not like that there's a lot of common uh, common objectives that uh, that they can pursue together Ja sam Ranko Milić, dolazim iz organizacije koja se zove Zdravi grad, a vodim projekt koji se zove SNC ili Eco Social Economy Network South and East Europe, odnosno mreža ekodruštvene ekonomije Južne i Sočine Evrope. 
sad da je to ovako malo duži naziv, ali u principu bavimo se promicanjem novih ekonomskih modela, novih ekonomskih oblika poduzeća koji u stvari su pokrenuta sa namjerom da pomognu rješavanju lokalnih problema. Znači, vjerujemo da svi znamo da u stvari je svijet u jednoj velikoj krizi, petrubaciji i socijalnoj, i ekonomskoj, i ekološkoj. I ovaj projekt u stvari radi na tome da koristi polugu ili način na koji poduzetnici općenito rade stvar, znači kroz jedan poduzetnički način mišljenja i djelovanja da se rješavaju i društvene probleme. Od zaštite okoliša, zapošljavanja slučajnih skupina do recimo, ne znam, reforme obrazovanja i svega ostaloga što u stvari je potrebno društvo, a što društvo samo ne uspijeva realizirati kroz svoje sustave. Tako da u stvari taj cijeli koncept društvenog i socijalnog podzatništva je jedan novi koncept, ali koji sve više ima odziva u svijetu jer potrebe su sve veće pa onda i takva neka rješenja inovativna se pokazuju kao neki mogući put da se pomogne ljudima, društvu, zajednicama da rješavaju te probleme. Ovaj projekt je u stvari započeo povezivanjem sedam partnerskih organizacija iz pet zemalja, iz Hrvatske, Italije, Srbije, Makedonije i Kosova. To su uglavnom organizacije civilnog društva koje su već se prije bavile raznim oblicima društvenih inovacija ili društvenog poduzetništva i koje su sad odružile snage da zajednički pokušaju svojiti jedan model kako promicati cijelu tu ideju u našim zemljama i u regiji u cijelini. I onda kroz ovaj projekt je u stvari stvorena jedna mreža koja će trajati nakon što se projekt završi, koja povezuje sve te subjekte koje sam prije spomenuo, ali je otvorena i drugim subjektima, odnosno mreža je kao takva otvorena i javnom i privatnom sektoru, i kroz tu mrežu smo među ostalog radili na nešćemu što je jedan novi model udruživanja subjekata oko pitanja razvoja, odnosno razvoja poduzetništva, a to je klasteri kao jedan poslovni model gdje se naražiti subjekti udružuju zajedno oko sličnih interesa ili komplementarnih interesa da bi radili dugoročno nekakve projekte ili nekakve zajedničke proizvode i usluge. Tako da u principu projekti kroz ove dvije godine radi dosta na osvještavanju ljudi o samom pojmu ekodruštvene ekonomije. Radili smo jednu razinu zagovaranja na razinama država i regije, pa je između ostalog to dovelo od toga da je socijalno poduzetništvo ušlo u programiranje evropskih fondova za ovu regiju kao jedan od prioriteta. Stvorene su nekakve osnovne razine i vlada da se radi na strategijama koordinirano tako da se u stvari vlade različitih zemalja udruže i zajedno razmenjuju dobra iskustva i loša iskustva i da na takav način u stvari rade manje grešaka nego do sada. Imali smo kroz aktivnosti projekta jednu vrlo zanimljivu edukaciju gdje smo 15 mladih ljudi educirali o tome što je to opće ekodrštveno poduzetništvo i kako u stvari njihove lokalne zajednice mogu i oni sami i njihove organizacije mogu iskoristiti tu priču da bi potekli zapošljavanje i razvoj. Imali smo u okviru projekta doniranje pilot projekata, znači imali smo natječaj gdje smo inicijativama davali izvjesna sredstva da mogu pokrenuti svoje ekodruštvene poduhvate, također smo davali i mentorsku podršku, a između ostalo imali smo i tu jednu inicijativu da se osvali sve ti subjekti u druže na nacionalnim razinama i regionalnim razinama kroz te klastere koji će, vjerujem, uspostati jedan samo održivi model ne samo podrške razvoja socijalnog poduzetništva, nego možda čak i svih onih neprofitnih inicijativa koje su lokalne zajednicama događaju, koje možda nitko ne prepoznaje kao nešto što bi trebalo sustavno podržavati, tako da onda ostavno nekaj na marginama. Tako da mi u stvari pokušavamo kroz ovaj klaster objediniti ljude koji imaju znanja, znači iskustva, oni koji imaju nekakve inicijative, ideje, projekte koji imaju opće značenje i vrijednost i sve one koji u stvari imaju interes da su dijeli u tome kao jedan sustav interesa koji onda zajedno rade ili projekte ili recimo rade neke nove proizvode usluge koje plasiraju zajedno na tržište. Na takav način u stvari dobijamo neku priliku da kroz jedan članski sustav omogućemo dugoročno djelovanje na tom području u našim lokalnim zajednicama i vjerujemo da će to možda biti jedan 
potica ili primjer kako bi se možda u nekim drugim segmentima moglo udruživati različite subjekte da nešto zajedno rade i stvaraju što od općeg interesa. Na kakve probleme ste nailazili? Mislim, što se tiče i partnera i financiranja, da li biste sad nakon ovog iskustva nešto drugačije napravili? Da li biste taj projekt drugačije konceptualizirali? Da li bi u provedbi nešto mijenjali? Pa svakako bi mnogo toga bilo drugačije. Mislim da je ono stara poslovica, lako je poslije bitke biti generale, ali evo, mnogo toga smo naučili. Jedna od svakako stvari je da je projekt već u startu imao veliko sufinanciranje koje nam je bio veliki izazov i još uvijek u stvari se borimo s tim izazovom, ali evo, u uvjetima krize nije lako za jedan veliki evropski projekt koji će budžet oko 650.000 eura osigurati 33% nekih 250.000 eura novca i to je bio u stvari najveći stres u cijelom projektu. Normalno da je bilo izazova i u tome što su različite organizacije imali različite kapacitete, pa smo imali male organizacije koje nisu imali iskustva i neke veće koje su imali iskustva, pa smo pokušavali i nakon krava i zemlje kao što je Kosovo koje smo imali situacije i raznih političkih i ratnih previranja, sukoba usred projekta gdje smo neke stvari mogli onda prilagođavati situacijama, tako da uvijek svaki svi ti projekti imaju puno izazova, ali su i na neki način jedna velika prilika i za učenje, za zbližavanje ljudi. Ja puno bolje danas razumijem cijelu ovu regiju, ne samo sa stanovišta pitanja ovoga projekta, nego sa stanovišta mnogih drugih aspekata i vjerujem da je to svima pomoglo u projektu da se u stvari malo bolje razumijemo. Svakako da u drugim sljedećim projektima priprema će biti još kvalitetnija i u stvari ova situacija sad poznavanja kakvi su kapaciteti lokalnih organizacija u različnim zemljama će nam pomoći da drugačije gradimo buduće konzorcije i partnerstva i da u stvari više i kvalitetnije možda koristimo snage, a lakše nekako prevazilazimo te slabosti koje će se pojavljivati uvijek i ne možemo ih izbjeći.